See, I think Devo was the greatest when, when we sounded like a machine, like James Brown and the Flames, but mm-hmm. we weren't. There were no click tracks. Alan right. Myers was the human click track. And Mark was playing incredibly inventive synths over the top. But it wasn't driven by, you know, digital or analog sequencer lines. Okay. It wasn't driven by drum machines. It was us. Yeah. And, and, the, and the frosting was the electronics. When it inverted itself, and now, you know, it's like what I was talking about with the iPhone and GPS. Now we're listening to what the machines make us do, mm-hmm. right? We've become fools, slaves to the machines. Just right. like society is a slave gig economy and addicted to technology. That's why they don't know what's happening to them, as we were talking about earlier yeah. with dystopia. Dystopia tonight. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I, I don't know if I can live up to that kind of an intro. I, I better be able to drink as much wine as she did last night. <laughs> <laughs> you just bring out two bottles. You start double fisting. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, I got a magnum here. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. Hey, beautiful. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's that's what made me, as soon as you said you had your own wine and you made your own wine, I immediately thought of Beth. I was like, Beth had a glass of wine. She started it out with. It's great. Yeah, this is my 50 by 50 Pinot Noir. Oh, beautiful, man. That's a great design, too. Yeah. Well, thank you. You know, I try to keep doing it. I was a designer before Devo and keep doing designing after Devo. I wanted to ask you, that's what I was going to ask you, too, because I know you did that kind of stuff. The the new album, the new album art, how much input did you have in that? I had a lot of input, but it's the first time in many, many, many years that I didn't do something myself or Mm -hmm. in collaboration with Mark because we did all you know, the graphics and and everything. Um, uh, And I directed the videos, but, Mm -hmm. but I worked with a guy who's incredible. I always, I'm always recognizing people that can do things I can't do. I know what I can do. I know what I can't do. Right. And uh, I know when there's good ideas that I didn't have. So Mm -hmm. this, uh, this this guy, Oh yeah. This guy that goes by the name of Tomo 77, T O M O 77. Um, very mysterious character. Uh, in <laughs> fact, he can't even get back into the United States right now because he's visa challenged. Oh. He, uh, it's an amazing talent. And, um, we gave him all the kind of imagery and information and photographs and backstory about my alter ego, Jihad mm-hmm. Jerry in the yeah. Doers. Yep. And I told him, you know, because of his artwork that I had seen, I told him I wanted a kind of a fetishistic kind of votive worship symmetrical graphic that was like pseudo religious, you know. Nice. Oh, and, it, perfect. Yeah. And he nailed it. He's yeah. great. Yeah, he's great. Have you always been good with kind of, um, uh, I want like I want to say relinquishing power. Like since you're the creative one and you kind of come up with this stuff and you like doing it on your own, being very hands on. Are you good at going? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell somebody else what I need and and step away. Well, the honest, the most honest thing I can say is, the best stuff comes from collaboration. It, you know, that's Indeed. the way I view it. And even when people aren't getting credit and they're and and they're, and they're in the shadows, they really contributed essential things to that guy that's like the narcissistic one man right. star. It really, I mean, um, I, I can't emphasize that enough. And and I know, you know, I, I know backstories and I know inside information. So even people like David Bowie, who, you know, I revere, mm-hmm. believe me, he was a massive, excellent, charming ripoff artist. <laughs> <laughs> wow what a what a great that was like a compliment and also just a yeah. brutal honesty in the same sentence that was nice but, but i mean he knew what to take yeah and then he yeah. would do it better right so, so yeah do you find that in a lot of 
uh because i mean i mean as a comedian like we see stuff like that kind of happen all the time all and the sometimes time, yeah. it's deliberate do you, but i don't i don't know the music industry as well but like do you find that a lot in music that that happens well there's homages and then there's straight ripoffs okay mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. <laughs> there's a spectrum mm -hmm. and but i mean the best artists obviously bring something to the table that goes beyond whatever material they're nicking yeah do you think that other artists are pretty forgiving when it comes to that kind of stuff? Because I think there's a guy on Instagram who's really good at kind of collecting these. I don't even know how he does it. He's like a uh, an encyclopedia for um, music that's been sampled over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have you seen this guy? He's incredible. I cannot think of his uh, name. Yeah, really yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but it's really great. But it seems like when I when I read up on it, like sometimes other artists know and they think the piece of music is so good, like you just said, that they're like, okay, this is obviously somebody who's kind of sampling a thing, but they've got their own identity and, and right. they're obviously really creative. Do you think it's more that than it is people getting pissed off and like um, immediately with lawsuits and stuff? I do, except uh, obviously if you're known in your own right, maybe not mm -hmm. on the same level as this guy that nicked you. Right. Uh, you, you know, you would prefer it if you were getting a piece of the action. Because, yeah. Come on. Yeah, absolutely. We all, we all need to live, you know? So yeah, totally. Uh, I, I respect the artists who acknowledge their sources and give them a piece of the action. I agree that I find that so fascinating too, because I know Olivia Rodrigo just ran into some, uh, not even trouble. Oh, yeah. I think, I think they were just like, you know, I mean, it was obvious to anybody. It was like a paramour thing, right, you know, like right. it was, song. but she right. was just like, yeah, no, give them the, you know, yes. <laughs> like yeah. I was influenced by it. Seems yeah, like exactly. an easier way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen that with Led Zeppelin repeatedly. Oh. They are in court. Yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, honest to God, if you listen to Led Zeppelin, it was much more than a ripoff. <laughs> right. They took it somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, totally. And you know what's crazy, too? I it's funny that you just said Led Zeppelin, because I just saw an interview um, with um, with him about uh, talking about uh, Greta Van Fleet. Mm. <laughs> and I, and I, it's so funny that I, I love those guys, too. But when they're interviewed, they never reference led zeppelin as an influence they, well, they never talk about robert right they can't yeah. and you know their management the label said do not talk about <laughs> Led Zeppelin. Yeah. absolutely yeah it's so so funny to me they're like oh you know Aerosmith and blah blah and i'm just sitting there like led zeppelin say yeah. it <laughs> yeah yeah the 800 pound gorilla in the room and he, you know and the and he moves like robert plant and the yeah. ridiculous clothes he put on puts on like retro Go back to like 1968. Absolutely. You know? yeah. yeah. It's so funny, man. I know. And then I just saw Robert Plant interview being like, yeah, they're around Led Zeppelin one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's like tracking their progress. It's pretty great. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. He seemed to take it in stride though. Um, what did you, what were your, uh, when you were starting out, what was your like, uh, cause everybody's got kind of somebody that they emulate when they start out when they're younger. Was there somebody that you saw on TV immediately or maybe live that got you into the whole music industry? You mean besides everybody that was a good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Besides everybody. I mean, it was like, for me, it was just a constant procession because, you know, I'm a senior citizen. So I, I mean. You look the, great. The first guy that did it to me was Elvis Presley, right? Oh, yeah. You know, I was, I was listening to Elvis Presley on 45s in my second cousin's bedroom and we were making out. Mm -hmm. You know, so oh, I was yeah. I was right there with the hillbilly in chief. You know, I was I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I was 12 and uh, Elvis <laughs> did it. And, yeah. then it was the, and then it was the Beatles. Then it was the Rolling Stones. Then it was Bob Dylan. Then it was, you know, the Yardbirds. And it just kept going. Yeah. Then it was Roxy Music and David Bowie. And oh, yeah. Just everybody who was original and creative. Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I wanted to listen to something like that. And once I heard one cut off the debut record there i was putting the needle down over and over and over i couldn't quit listening to it wow you know. that's uh so was it like something that you just knew you wanted to do immediately or was it when you were a kid did you have like other aspirations oh yeah this isn't something i, I saw myself doing i mean i was i was i was an artist i was a visual artist mm -hmm. but i was uh you know i had I had a high IQ and I had a kind of a more of a literature and science direction. Oh. I thought where I was going to end up after my, you know, 
middle school phase where I thought I was going to be an astronaut and then a Formula One race driver. Nice. I, you know, when I grew <laughs> up, I thought I was going to be a college art professor. That's what I thought I was going to do. So <laughs> it wasn't until like 1970 that I said, no, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to be on stage and make music. Oh, nice, man. Were your parents cool? Like, did you tell anybody or would you keep that private? Because I know sometimes people are like, they don't want to tell anybody their dreams because if it doesn't pan out, they don't want to be embarrassed by it. But what, did you tell anybody? Well, sure. All my peers, I told. And my parents mm. had already checked out on me long before that because I was a guy that questioned illegitimate authority. And, you know, woe be to a blue collar Catholic kid in Ohio who questions any authority. Right. I mean... You grow up in the shadow of the priests, the cops, you know, the, the mayor, the, <laughs> the the dean of the college. I mean, and of course, your your dad is going to whip you with a belt. So, um, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, <laughs> they they checked out on me as soon as I said, I'm not going to church anymore. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that had to be crazy. That, was, that brings up a, a question that one of my friends, I think we were talking backstage about my friend Emily Grove, who just saw you guys live. Um, right. and she said you were a fucking amazing. She just loved the whole show. Um, but kind yeah, of she, <laughs> yeah, she, oh yeah, she, she's a great uh, musician and singer and, and songwriter and, uh, she's been doing it for a while, but, um, she wanted to know, um, how did you get into the church of the sub genius and does it still play into, uh, your style of writing today? Probably in an abstract way, because I mean, <clears throat> the church of the sub genius was the only quote church organized religion made mm -hmm. sense to Devo because it was mocking authoritarian organized religion. The big three, I call them, it's like Detroit, the big three. We have the, you know, Christian fundamentalists, the Jewish fundamentalists and the Muslim fundamentalists and, mm -hmm. and between them all. And they you know, they all provoke each other and hate, you know, liberty and hate tolerance and right. um, hate individual choice. Uh, they're they're you know tyrants, right. tyrants. So the Church of the Subgenius was attacking that, mm -hmm. and 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 they were attacking the same things as Devo, which was, look, everybody's a fool here. The, the you know, humans are an absurd species, and we don't even know what we don't know. Right. You know, I'm, not, I'm talking like Rumsfeld now. Right. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, some people know what they don't know. And then that leads them to not do certain things yeah. because they know enough to know they don't know. So right. <laughs> and, and that's where the church, you know, that's where the church of the subgenius, uh, you know, laid its claim, its foundation. And we're like, oh, yeah, we should have known these guys all our lives. In fact, we feel like we did. Right. And of course, we meet, you know. Reverend Stang, you know, Doug Smith. And it's like, yeah, this guy could have been our friend in, in, in Ohio. In oh, that's awesome. And so, yeah, I became a, a member of the church and then a minister. You know, I performed nice. three or four weddings. <laughs> oh, <laughs> do you keep that in your brain? Is it like the back of your head when you're writing, when you're making music, when you're being creative in any sense? Well, I keep the bigger idea that the church of Subgenius tapped into and that we tapped into unbeknownst to each other. I mm -hmm. do keep that big idea of the, nice. uh, the fundamental absurdity, the, the, the duality of human nature that all the greatest minds like Carl Jung yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> dissected long ago. I mean, talk about a dark side. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, human, humans, they have it down. Yeah. I mean, how, how, how nice that we uh, completely embody and, and magnify what, what, is the principle of the universe, which is matter and anti antimatter. Mm -hmm. And you know that there's a preponderance of dark matter in the universe. Yep. And that's what you're seeing all the time in the procession of, uh, quote, human history culture. Mm -hmm. And we're in, we're in some of the darkest times since uh, the dark ages or the medieval times since the dawn of man right now. Yeah. Which is so, it's funny that you say that too, because we were talking about the dystopia tonight. The essence of dystopia tonight is exactly what you just said. But also, like, it's kind of funny that we are in those kind of times, but we don't really realize it because oh, we of do. What, what we do. <laughs> but I mean, like, but it's kind of funny because you, you would, you picture those kinds of times as 
kind of you know in black and white and kind of drudgery and all of this shit but we've got so much to distract us you know what i mean sure social media uh any any kind of media at all you know just in general but you know what i mean like social media we're constantly clicking we got our phones computers video like all that other shit so you can when you tell stupid people that you know hey this is not good times so you're like get the fuck out of here you know <laughs> like they have yeah no, it's like i got yeah. my iphone I yeah. pay hundred dollars a month, and I'm just on it all the time. Yeah, it's you know, crazy. They look people people that have been driving to grandma's house for forty years suddenly don't know the way unless they take their phone, plug it into their car, and and listen to you know the computer Siri voice tell them where to go, and they'll even go a wrong way because they doubt themselves. Yes. Okay, that's me. You just described me to a T. Like, I know, I obviously know where my friends' houses are and shit like that. Like, stuff like my town that I grew up in. But when I go out on the road to go to gigs, if that GPS dies, I got nothing. I can't see. I shouldn't be driving. Um, I can't see. Right. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, I've had it go out on me a couple times. And, so the uh, subversion is complete. Yeah, yeah. Who thought they'd right. be paying $100, $150 a month for a device, right? Tell somebody that even 40 years ago. Yeah. Here's what you're going to do, and it's going to tell you everything to do, and you will doubt yourself unless you obey this phone. Oh, absolutely. And furthermore, what's happened now with with uh, there's been enough of that over time, people are actually losing their uh, ability conceptually to think on their own about directions. They yeah. don't understand north, south, east, and west, oh, yeah. and they don't listen to their own common sense. That's been exercised from ex excised from them yep and uh that's what you're seeing and that same thing has happened uh with sound bites and people's uh lack of critical faculties they cannot uh discern the difference between information and disinformation they mm -hmm. can't watch an ad and critically say this is full of shit yeah they, you know they, they can't analyze it they've right. lost those faculties so we are devolving for real mm -hmm. and there's just been articles where Scientists have, in, in fact, empirically backed that up. It's not just yeah. a Devo rap. Well, um, our yeah. schools aren't catching up with it either. That's the other thing, too, is like I think just recently they've got college courses and stuff like that where they're literally hiring people to teach the difference between real, like fact checking, real and fake news, like that kind of stuff, because it's it's beginning to be too much but honestly like our our schools are having a hard time catching up with all this stuff well and that was by design that started like i think in the nixonian area era because i mean again right wing authoritarian republicans wanted to destroy public education because hey look what it produced it produced yep. all those goddamn sdsers right yeah we got to we got to do something about that like let's ruin public education right. so that so that the average person who isn't born with a silver spoon, who doesn't have a billionaire daddy, they can't get the information. They can't get an education. So, of course, they don't learn how to analyze and process information, how to yeah. think critically. They can't think critically. And they were, you know, I mean, liberal arts was destroyed. So nobody was reading real literature. You know, right. it, all just, it all just went to trash. And comic right, books right. And, you know. Yeah. Is that the kind of when you're when you're writing and creating music, especially back then? Was that the kind of stuff you were drawing from? Were you pulling from all literature and stuff that you had read, and and sure. just what was going on in the world and stuff? Yes. Is that something that you think about? Do you think it's more um, just a natural ability that you have, or do you have to consciously go, okay, look, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write, and I'm going to draw from A, B, C, and D? Well, you know, I just lucked out in the sense that the era I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in northeastern Ohio, which you could you could check this, back check this, it happened to be one of the uh, highest levels of public education in the whole country. So the, the schools were amazing. So I just got a good education. And like any creative kid who got a good education, you're turned on by the stuff you're being fed by, yeah. by the way, smart, articulate teachers who cared. Right. It was, it's, yeah. it's a concept that's gone. It's arcane now. Nobody's yep. going to reference literature now in their lyrics. It's just right. like, you know, the bitch was a hoe and I wanted some mo and, you know, stuffed it in her hole. Right. Yeah, no, you're right. You know, it's, I just, this is so weird, but I, uh, 
I, I found um, I had a third grade teacher that I loved. Like when I was a kid, she was like the best. Sure. And uh, an, uh, one of the one of the librarians that was at the elementary school, which is gone. I went to an elementary school that was really small and it was one grade, um, a one classroom per grade. And that was it. So you kind of knew everybody until you graduated. That's fantastic. Third grade teacher. Uh, her name was uh, Karen D'Antonio. We call her Miss D. Um, she retired and moved to to moved away in 2004, moved out of the state completely. She basically lives off the grid. I tried to find her forever. Finally got her number. I called her today and I, we had this wow. great long conversation. Wow. Yeah. Cause I just, I, she was a huge influence on my life and, and, uh, she, she's one of those rare individuals who didn't just teach yeah. what the book told her to teach. She taught you yeah. about giving a shit. She taught you about life. Yeah. And the best Isn't thing was, amazing? Yeah. And, and the best thing was too, is she was just like, we, you know, we kind of caught up a bit. She, she knew I was doing stand up because I think just when she had retired and left, I was going into comedy and she was like, do it, do it makes you happy. Don't worry about anybody else. And then, um, uh, but we were talking about politics and stuff and she's just as much of a radical, like, you know, in third grade, you're not picking up on that kind of stuff, but right, I had a right. feeling right. that she was just yeah. like, you know, like me. And then just to hear her constantly, like, she was like universal health. It's like, I'm as far left as you can go. And I was just like, this is fucking awesome. So yeah, we had a great time. So I love that you just said that. Cause it's true. It's, it's not something that's really sticking around. I, I had two, I had two teachers like that in high school that you're describing mm -hmm. that changed the course of my life and saved me from uh, probably, you know, ending up in my father's machine shop where he was employed. Uh -huh. uh, because they they led me through the process and and showed me how I could get a scholarship so I could go to school or go to college. Nice. And then in college, I had three more over the course of undergraduate and graduate school. Again, it, I still know who they are. I remember everything. They they're is exactly as you described your teacher. They wow. changed everything. Yeah. And, I, and but, yeah, go ahead. they made a difference. Yeah. And that's, and that's it. I mean, I'm sure in some pockets there's this place like that too, but I've got friends who are teachers who became teachers because of people like that. And I think that the, the whole thing kind of sucks because they kind of, you know, they're aware always talking about what's going on today and it's just, everything's getting tighter. And like, I've, I've had some that have wound up leaving because they had to teach on a schedule. And if they didn't stop the subject that they were teaching at a certain time, regardless of who fell behind, they would be disciplined for it. Yeah. So there was, sure. you know, it, it's just a bummer. Well, public public education is a oxymoron now. I mean, right. it's been sabotaged. Absolutely, totally sabotaged on purpose. Yep. I guarantee it. Yeah, absolutely. the same way that DeJoy uh, sabotaged the USPS. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy that we're all watching this kind of stuff happen and we're caught in the middle and none of us get like, you know, I mean, it's it sucks because I'm sure you're the same way where you want to speak out, you want to say stuff. But at the same time, it just feels like everybody's spinning their wheels. And well, you, you can know. say stuff, but it's going to go nowhere. Exactly. Yeah, right. exactly. Which I is mean, that's what that's what you're watching here is time after time after time. You're watching these psychotic tyrants mm -hmm. do things that you thought when you were growing up that were absolutely illegal and impossible in a democratic rule of law, like absolutely yeah. impossible. Like you would be punished, but they, they keep like the bully on the playground going, fuck you. What are you going to do about it? Show yes. me what you, and everybody goes, well, that's not right. I don't know what I can do about it. And then the yeah. law, the, the lawmakers are so corrupt yeah. and so compromised and co-opted that hmm. they give them a pass. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing that you, like you just said, like they, they've gotten more comfortable with telling people, you know who they really are especially oh. like, especially oh, after yeah. the trump era like like i think like republicans and the right kind of used to hide the shitty individuals oh, yeah, they yeah, were yeah, they yeah, had this yeah. great you know they, you know they love the veil the man behind the curtain kind of thing and then though oh, oh, oh. now it just seems like they're like they don't give a fuck anymore they're like That's what right. are, exactly they're like what are you going to do about it and you're like fuck and then the same thing too because even on our side we have these kind of like feckless individuals who are just not getting the right messaging Absolutely. out there and Absolutely. then the rest of us you know the the uh the the quote unquote we're not even i want to say normies but you know what i mean civilians as far as politics goes nothing we can do we can tweet it, it's we can we can protest show. it's yeah. a horror show yeah and it's not just america but although america is at the Somebody just said Devo was right about everything. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it all comes back to Devo is what I'm saying. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. We Do thought we were just being, you know, cheeky. We yeah. thought we were just warning people like canaries in a coal mine 
about something that really wasn't going to happen. Um, right. And boy, yeah. then it is it weird to be did. kind of a uh, uh, prophetic? Well, it's not. Do you guys talk about that? Mean, we do, but this isn't what we wanted. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's horrific. I mean, it's 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 really like episode of Black Mirror that never ends. Yeah. It's like uh, it's what we went through a wormhole in space into an alternate reality nightmare. Honest to God, we did. Yeah, absolutely. You know what's funny is you'll you'll hear stuff like this is what I this is what I love about the dystopia aspect of it. So there's all the crazy stuff that's going on, right? And then you'll just see something like this. This is an NPR headline. I normally don't do this, by the way, but I just got to bring it up because right. it's hilarious. NPR right. headline from today. A 36-year-old who seems to have been disguised as an old woman in a wheelchair threw a piece <laughs> of cake at the Mona Lisa. Yeah. That's insane. That does not, that's like an Onion article. I don't it, know it, how well, that made a headline. I don't know how it made a headline either, but it's hilarious. Well, yeah, and, and, and you're right. It's like the Onion, but everything's like the Onion. Yeah. I mean, that's why you don't need the onion. It's right. all the onion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is just so, so absolutely bizarre. Um, but I want to go back. I'm sorry. I like I got a little off track there. Went on a yeah, yeah, tangent. Yeah. But I want to go that's back better. to. So you were, um, you know, you had started your venturing into music and stuff like that. You had your idols stuff. What was your like your first like big gig? Do you remember like your first paid gig? Like something that you, uh, you know, felt like, holy shit, I'm in the music business now. Well, like. Like many people who start out, I, I didn't start out just from a, a tabla rosa, you know, creative explosion. I, I, first of all, was trying to learn to play the bass well. And then I got in this locally famous blues band in Ohio, in northeastern Ohio, mm. called the Numbers Band, the 1565 band. They were very famous. Okay. Bob Kidney was the lead guy. And he was like a musicologist. I mean, this guy had you know, a wall 20 feet long and seven feet high of all the best LPs from VJ and and uh, Imperial and the Library of Congress and mm -hmm. all these, you know, uh, uh, rare recordings of all the greatest blues and rhythm and blues artists in their early days. And he was a harmonica master that learned how to play like little Walter. And, uh, and so, you know, I... I was a student of the blues, you know, and the blues yeah. <clears throat> was very appealing to college kids in the 60s because uh, it was our music, roots music, right. you know, coming from, you know, black people who had been fucked over forever. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so we, you know, we had, you know, there's, you heard about penis envy. We had black envy. <laughs> right. So, so I learned to play all these songs and I was in the band with him and, you know, would make maybe 25 bucks a night. thought that was a big deal. But we played in the clubs in uh, Akron and, and Cleveland and Kent. And we played mostly at JB's and the Cove and uh, some big crowds. And, and it wow. really got me used to being on stage and in front of people. But then, of course, given who I was, I, I wasn't going to be able to just stay there under this, you know, orthodoxy, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I was writing songs. <laughs> um, was it, would you, did you feel like you were comfortable there or did you feel, because that's, that's a, another thing too, is like, I love hearing about ba people's bands that they started or whatever, but I like to know what made them go, okay, this isn't enough. I want to go on to the next thing. What was the, what was that moment for you? I realized I was just being uh, academic. Mm. And I was being imitative. And I certainly, you know, wasn't a guy that grew up in Mississippi as an orphan and shooting heroin. So um, I had to, I had to like find who I was and what I wanted to say. Right. And then uh, by doing that, though, is that when you like, what was the, how long between that and like founding Devo? Uh, about two and a half years. Two and a half years. And so in that mm -hmm. amount of time, were you just experimenting with other stuff? Were you writing? Were you meeting other bands? I met Mark in, while I was in 15, 60, 75, the numbers band. And because what I was doing that was completely original and creative was my own art. Okay. And Mark was, Mark was doing his art. And I never saw Mark because he wasn't actually a student at Ken. He, he would come and take classes, but he lived in Akron. And he wasn't ever around hanging out like 
like my peers who were all like, you know, on 16 hour course loads and going for a degree for four years. So I tracked him down off campus Wow! after the, after the killings at Kent state, mm -hmm. you know, cause I was a member of SDS and right. You were there when it happened. I was in the middle of it. And two of my four, I mean, two of the people who got killed out of the four that got killed were my friends. Oh so, my God. I'm so sorry, man. Yeah. Alison Krauss and Jeffrey Miller. Wow. Holy so, shit. So anyway, we were suddenly not allowed on campus and campus was yellow taped off for like three and a half months and four months actually. And, uh, and I met Mark and I loved what he was doing with his art. And mm -hmm. I had been drawing these little cartoon potatoes. We, cause my friends and I, that I had a little academic group. The main guy was Bob Lewis. And we were formulating these ideas about de-evolution theoretically. Oh, wow. So I was making Devo art. That's great. And I, and I had these potatoes and I saw that Mark had been doing decals, you know, water release decals that he was silk screening, photo silk screening. And I went, wow, that's the way I want to do my potatoes. And I want to put them on all these horrible, you know, these terrible professors in the yearbook with their crew cuts. and Nice. Food. You know, these horrible people that were terrible professors. I was blew them up and put potatoes on, you know, chomping at their cheeks and their heads. and Oh, that is eyes. amazing. But Mark helped me do that. And, uh, and we formed a friendship. And then I found out he was, you know, in this band called Flossie Bobbitt that was this, uh, you know, prog rock band in Athens. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was pretty wanky. And he hated the blues band. He thought that was really uncreative and wanky. Oh, and wow. so we, we started um, just jamming and, 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 and experimenting because he had synthesizers. Nice. So I was giving him all my, you know, philosophical ideas and these odd bass lines that were, you know, meant to be really caveman crude and beyond the mm -hmm. blues. And he was putting all these sounds over the top of them that were abstract and cacophonous and atonal. And nice. I loved it. And yeah. so we just, we decided, okay, if anything sounds like a genre or anything sounds like what's on the radio, it's over. Like we nix it. Great. So as soon as one person doesn't like it or says that sounds like, you know, bad company, fuck that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so that's how we started. And we just started searching and experimenting kind of tabla rosa blind. Wow. No, no, no intent, no goal. Right. How much of it, I mean, because with that kind of camaraderie and also that kind of creative, free, creative freedom, how did you kind of narrow down exactly what you wanted into a thing? Because if you're just messing around like that and kind of improvising, there must have been a lot left on like the cutting room floor, oh, yeah. so to speak. Oh, yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, did you ever I mean, want to go any, back? Like, no, no. Any creative artist, if they're honest, mm -hmm. they know when they have a gem and they know when they have a turd. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, you know when something's cool because you'll hear something and get excited. So then you develop mm. it. Or then I start reciting some lyrics that I've had written in a book over it. And Mark, you know, your, your partner goes, oh, yeah, keep doing that. Right. So, yeah. you know, when you're on to something, you know, when it's worth pursuing and right. you know, when something's just wanky or bad. Sure. Are you ever tempted to go? I mean, how good are you at, at making something and then once it's done, it's done and moving on to the next thing? Or do you ever go, oh, you know what? We can make this better if we go back and mess around with it a little bit more. Are you, are you that kind of person? We were more that kind of person in the beginning. Yeah, mm. we were. And, and, um, and then because you're caught in the soup and you're, you know, you're in the middle of things and now you're one of the guys that you used to laugh at because you're signed to a label and you have schedules, um, <laughs> you start to change. I mean, anybody that says they don't change is lying. Right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good point too. I mean, I guess, cause I was watching the, uh, the Rick Rubin, um, uh, docu-series with McCartney and it's the first time I'd ever really seen anybody go back with the soundboard. I never, you never really get to see that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'd be like, I, I don't know if I would be, if I was a musician, I don't know if I'd be tempted enough to keep going back and like just playing around and tweaking everything all day long. I don't, I don't, you know, 
because even you know comedians have the have the uh, you know ability to go back and edit stuff because nobody remembers our shit anyway half the time. <laughs> you know you know what I mean? nobody cares so like you can be like oh i added this tag to the joke or whatever but i feel like for for music it's very like um like even me like if i have a a bunch of albums by a, a singer a songwriter whatever it is and I grew up listening to that album. Like this is gonna sound hokey. I was I love John Denver. I always get hesitant. <laughs> I know I always I always hesitate to say it because I feel like people are like, really, John Denver? But I do. I love John Denver. But he's got so many different variations of those songs, right? And I know yeah. other artists have it too. But I remember like I love the ones I grew up with. And then I'll and then I'll meet somebody else who's a John Denver fan. And they're like, oh, this album. And he's singing. I don't know, off yeah. whatever. I'm like, this isn't it. This isn't Country Roads. This is horseshit. Well, of course, uh, we, we love <laughs> we love what we. We love what what was important to us as we developed in our lives. Those critical moments where you, as an organism, yeah. are changing. You know, we're talking about 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Every year is different. Mm -hmm. You know, all the way through your twenties. Um, yeah, and and it drills into your skull. It goes right into your subconscious. It's always there. Yeah. Did you guys have? Um how were you guys handling like producers and stuff like that? People that wanted to come in and mess with your music. Were you, Not well. <laughs> I didn't, I wouldn't, I was going to say just from everything you told me, I imagine that must've been hard. It sure was because we were doing things on purpose. You know, we were, a, mm -hmm. we were both conceptual and purposeful, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, man, we don't know what we're doing, but Jesus just recorded, see what happened. You know, we weren't those guys. And so everything was thought out. Yeah. And there was a reason we did something. So if suddenly a producer wanted to get rid of something we had worked on for two years and thought out, mm -hmm. it was like, no, that's yeah. that's the point of the song, you know? Yeah, and, absolutely. Now, we did have some decent experiences, you know, that where the juxtaposition, the intersection more or less worked out. And that, of course, with Eno, that was true. With Brian right. Eno, that was true. And then with Bob, Bob Margoloff on the third record, Freedom of Choice, that was true. Right, right. There's there's so many people that I've talked to uh, coming out of this pandemic and the time we've all had off, like especially musicians who were like, I loved making it was hard, but I loved being able to make my own music and not have somebody breathing over my shoulder. Sure. And I yeah. feel like that's got to be uh, how most people feel when they're do when they're doing that kind of stuff. Well, because it gets back to the reason you started to do anything to begin with. And that's right. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah it is weird that the more the more successful you get sometimes in an industry or in a creative field the less you're doing it for fun anymore that's the problem yeah money takes over right you know image takes over expectations take over absolutely no nobody nobody started off that was any any huge band they didn't start off like we're gonna write a hit and make money yeah they, they just started to do something that was so good that right. everybody lost it I mean, right. that's what Jimi Hendrix was. Yeah, you know, and and it came from fun, right? It came from fun. You didn't do it to make money. Now you start making money from what was fun. Now it inverts itself and becomes perverted. Yeah. Did you? How do you feel about the? I mean, because it's. I know, like nowadays, kind of. Uh, you know, we've got all those TV shows that are like the music ones and the, I can't think America's got talent, all that kind of stuff. How do you feel about those kind of things? Like, are you supportive of anybody starting anyway? I know it's, it's really hard because you're like, well, I don't know how people are going to get out there, but I, I feel the same way. I think you probably do, which is, yeah, just start a band in your garage and go for it. Well, I mean, they, those shows are really antithetical to true creative process. What that is, is just a wanky, narcissistic, watch how many notes I can hit, look how many stylings I can do. There's mm -hmm. nothing original there. It's completely constipated. Yeah. I mean, if you think of any of the greatest artists in the world with careers with longevity, like, mm -hmm. say, Bob Dylan, he would have been kicked off of that show the first time. They would have, wouldn't have got to the second show. Neither would Mick Jagger. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the truth because they were originals. I remember people said, he can't sing. That's a damn joke, man. <laughs> you know, I got sent to the principal for bringing Bob Dylan record, another side of Bob Dylan into my English class. Cause they said, we want everybody to bring in their favorite poet on Wednesday. Wow. And I said, well, my poet, you know, I come in with a little portable record player that mm -hmm. plays vinyl and with speakers. And I said, my, my favorite poet, he, he makes music and his poems, he sings to acoustic guitar. And they're wow. like, 
oh, wait a minute. And <laughs> I put um, all I really want to do is baby be friends with you on when oh, he goes, nice. all I really want to do. <laughs> and it's like, turn that off right now, mister. <laughs> and they send me to the principal because I had made fun of the assignment. Oh, my God. That's great. Um, we have another question from uh, from the audience that's watching. Um, Emily Grove wanted to know, did you know uh, Chrissy Hine when she was at Kent State? Oh, sure. Um, Chrissy Hine was the sister, the younger sister of the um, saxophone player in 1560-75, Terry Hine. Terry Hine was a fantastic jazz man. He taught me a lot about jazz okay. and uh, played a lot of great, you know, vintage jazz recordings for me and got me going on something I didn't understand and made me understand it. Anyway, she used to come to our rehearsals and want to get up on stage wow. and play harmonica and sing like, hey, can I come up now? And of course, you know, Terry's telling her no way. And Bob Kidney, who was, you know, pretty chauvinistic, he's like, <laughs> Terry, do something about your sister. And she go, fuck you guys. Fuck you, asshole. <laughs> she was like 14 saying, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> And, and she would hang around the student union and uh, and 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 just talk shit and and talk wow. about music and and like within two years she was gone she had she'd split and gone to England. Holy shit, that's incredible. Um, and she has she has one more question too. As the albums progressed, uh, so did the gear. Did any of the new tech or since? Uh, synths, electronic drums, drum machines, sequencers, etc., dictate how the songs were uh, written and recorded. Did they way have too, any way too much. See, I think Devo was the greatest when, when we sounded like a machine, like James Brown and the Flames, but mm -hmm. we weren't. There were no click tracks. Alan right. Myers was the human click track, and Mark was playing in incredibly inventive synths over the top, but it wasn't driven by, you know digital or analog sequencer lines okay. it wasn't driven by drum machines it was us yeah. and and the and the frosting was the electronics when it inverted itself and now you know it's like what i was talking about with the iphone and gps now we're listening to what the machines make us do mm -hmm. right we become fools slaves to the machines just right. like society is a slave gig economy and addicted to technology that's why they don't know what's happening to them as we were talking about earlier yeah. with dystopia they don't even understand that they've already been corralled like cattle and put in the barn because they can play video games and look at their iphone <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> absolutely this is great you know yeah <laughs> let's bring on a uh, friend of the show dan pasternak right now super right. fan of devo by the way Hi, Dan. What's going on, man? Hey, thanks so much for having me, guys. Jerry, wow, man, such a pleasure. <laughs> I, have a nice. little, I, I have a little artifact here I dug out. Uh, I still have this from a show that you guys did at the Santa Monica Civic a little over 40 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's yep. so cool. Yep. I remember. I loved the Santa Monica Civic as a, as a venue. It's so sad to see it go down. Oh my God! I mean, such a, a, a like a, a, an important part of my childhood was spent seeing shows there, but particularly you guys. Isn't that where they filmed uh, the T A M I show? M you know, Tammy show, with where they brought in Teenage American Music International. They had British bands. They had James Brown with the Rolling Stones. They had Jan and Dean. Oh, and they really? Was that yes. The Santa Monica Civic, and they, they they shot it in black and white. 1965 there, and then they put it in the uh, drive-in theaters all around America. Right. The T-A-M-I yeah. show. It's great to watch. Oh, wow. I, I've seen it. I, I don't think I realized that that was at the Civic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw Gary Newman there on his first oh. American tour. I saw, uh, uh, God, craft work there when they had uh, done, uh, the, you know, the computer song that made him made him. A big hit in America. Oh, uh, um, made, uh, oh my God! I know what pocket about. calculator. That's yeah. it. Yeah, great show. Great. You show. guys, you guys, all of you, Gary. We had Gary Newman on the show as well too. He had some amazing stories. You guys all need to get together and do some kind of literal dystopian prophetic tour because you guys really did call the machine kind of, you know, whatever yeah. era we're living in now. It's yeah. uh yeah. You guys really should get together and do that. I'm gonna yeah. 
leave that on the table and leave it up to you guys. But uh, one of the I thought you were going to say you were going to organize it. One of the things that appealed to me so much, and Jerry, I'd be curious to sort of hear your perspective on this. It was clear to me that your audience not only sort of dug what you guys were doing musically, but conceptually. You know what I mean? That there was something overtly satirical yeah. in the entire presentation of Devo. Do you think that that there is an audience now for that kind of smart, mm. literate, satirical? No. <laughs> that, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah, right. Absolutely not. No, it's like satire, irony, they're lost. Because we now have, you know, we, we're, we're really in devolved society. And mm. it's subhuman. And I wish it was maybe, you know, controlled by AI and machines. That would be more interesting than the fact that we have the worst of both worlds. What right. we have is pseudo-Christian right-wing tyrants driving policy as a minority, thwarting the will of the majority who are reasonable people. Mm -hmm. This is insane. This has nothing to do with science. This I'd rather be governed by, you know, Spock type laws. I mean, yes. well, you guys to me were Spock. counterbalance to kind of the Reagan era to me and Jerry That's Falwell right, right. and the moral majority. Like I felt like that you guys were um, kind of leveling the playing field for those. That's what we were doing. Yeah, but, we were doing. but for those of us who thought like, oh, we're not crazy. Like society is shouldn't be going in this direction. Yeah, but they won. Right. The bad and guys won, in but, case you haven't noticed. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the other crazy thing is, too, is what's cool is, I mean, when you guys were doing it back then, no one had ever seen anything like that. So right. it was like, and, and, the, and the thing that always happens now, and I think it always happens at a different speed, is the other side, the guys who are currently winning, they, they get, they get a hold of what to do and how to course correct right. whatever whatever subversion real fucking quick. Like That's even right. look at look at the BLM protests and then look at even you know um, uh, COVID situation stuff like that too. As soon as they realized like stuff was out of control for a little bit, especially with the protests, and we were kind of gaining some speed. We're like, oh, this is a global thing. People have had enough. You know, even with COVID, they were like, we need socialized medicine. Bernie Sanders was right. Look what's going on in the world. This is what happens when you don't have this. And then they quickly adapted. I mean, the media got behind it. Everybody wanted to get back to normal. You know, the BLM protests fell on basically deaf ears and they were like, we hear you. We will get rid of Aunt Jemima. It's fine. And everyone's <laughs> like, no one fucking said, no, we didn't. Did you, did you say, I didn't say, you know, I mean, so they're, they're really good right now at kind of counteracting that. And we're not, but when they're you excellent. guys were doing they're that, it was better. like, you know, you could make a difference. You could, you could really change minds. And, 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 and you're right, uh, lot, you know, what you were saying is a large part of our audience did get it because we mm. were letting them in on it. So mm. they were in on it with us. We weren't trying to shove something down their throats at all. Yeah, was, I felt oh, fully point. engaged. Like I was texting a little bit with John before he said, oh, you guys should, you, you should come on with us. Um, mm. I remember one of the great things growing up in L.A., number one, was getting to see you guys a lot because you performed a lot in the L.A. area in sort of late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. But also there was great freeform radio when radio was a thing. And I had texted uh, John about this album that they did on K-Rock that was okay. all just... Do you remember the Devotees album? Yeah, yeah sure do. Yeah. <laughs> And it, and it felt like your your fan base was so engaged that a whole album of sort of even more whimsical Devo cover songs could be a thing on Rhino Records. Well, they they uh, they gave us a voice in that. They let us pick a lot of the tracks because they got oh, so many wow. submissions. There were like 50 or 60 submissions. They had to narrow it down to like 10 or 11. And they they would send us all the tracks and we had a, had a voice in it, vote. What I loved was there was one track on there uh, where someone played Jocko Homo on a touch tone telephone. There you go. <laughs> That's yeah. so great. It was great. Yeah. I, w I mean, I, I think there's still, I, I think you guys probably, you know, I mean, not not to say that like you wouldn't do it anyway, but I think I think there is still somewhat room for that kind of stuff. So, like, I think your your opinion and your voice and your writing and stuff like that, especially on the new stuff, um, that you're working on. I think it still has meaning and an opinion that you need to get out there. I just think you're right. It just kind of like, it's hard to get through some of the noise, but I think it's still important to try. Do you feel it's still important to, to keep Well, I, I obviously do. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, I'm speaking for myself now. I never lost the spirit. Right. 
there may be a, you know a nest a, a way to do it in a different way like i i don't mm. think you know and especially with mark's aversion to playing live i, I don't think it's right. going to be devo on stage that does it um you know possibly uh, i'll start um a podcast with a call in and video element called nice. De devolutionary times Ooh, that's a great name for a podcast well, I copyrighted it. So. Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, very smart. And, and I mean, I, I, I would enjoy doing that uh, just the way you are really good at doing what you're doing right now. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I love, I mean, I would absolutely subscribe and listen to that kind of stuff. I think more stuff like this is is needed. I like, you know, I think it's the way to get out different perspectives and different voices and stuff like that right now. I think yeah. it's the, yeah. the way to go. Um, and I will be your first subscriber to that. Uh, I love a podcast with a good name, like hooks me almost immediately. I may get killed like George Car Carlin. <laughs> or, or uh, <laughs> it got real dark there for a second. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, I love it though. It's nice and surprising. Um, I got to ask, so working on the new album, what was that process like for you? Did you do it during um covid did you do it during downtime were you already working on it beforehand what was the whole evolution of that the truth is i wrote 90 percent of the songs on the album called minus not a holy war mm. by jihad jerry and the right Doors. i wrote all, almost all of them between 2004 and 2005 in response to what the bush administration did to iraq right and got us into a bogus war with a dog and pony show uh, led at the UN by by uh, Colin Powell, who disgraced himself by lying as a pretext to do what you know the Bush boys wanted to do, right. and uh, and then couldn't really find any way to get it out there. Mm -hmm. And and then I recorded some new songs in response to the Trump years, which trumped anything that had happened before it <laughs> makes what you're talking about with jerry falwell look like kindergarten uh i mean we're there now. we right. are there yeah you watched you know you watched a vile disgusting heap of a man forget what party he's representing you watched a lying thug lay waste to democratic rule of law and walk away free Absolutely. And, and you've watched lies become truth. It's double think. It's 1984 happened. Right. We're there. Those books now, like 1984, Animal Farm, Brave New World, they might as well be primers in high school. Uh, not, not, not like dark, you know, warnings or prophetic this or that. It's just like, no, this was a playbook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's what you've watched. It's done. I mean, yeah. look, look what he just did at the NRA, like a day after the massacre, right. and he reads the names off, and then they they hit that bell. It's like a, a boxing bell at the end of a round. Yeah. After every name, uh, and then awful. he does a dance. I yeah. mean, you can't you can't make this shit up. Right. No, the, the chime was almost Pavlovian in its intention, right? Incredible. Absolutely. Good point. Incredible. Yeah. And it what's crazy is this for sane people, you're like still trying to wrap your head around what the fuck you're actually watching when it's happening. Because you're well, like, you're going, look what he's doing, everybody. Look what he's doing. Everybody. Yeah. What do you mean? He's just reading those names because he really cares. Right. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. You have yeah. to deal with everybody look, else's cognitive dissonance while you're it's like, like look where he is. Everybody in the audience on the AR 15s and thinks 18 year old psychos should be able to buy them without a background check. It's like, this is the world you live in asshole. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They just had uh, some guy just confronted Ted Cruz in a restaurant and yeah, it's the yeah, same. Yeah. they're so good at, at deflating that situation. They just say the same shit over and over again until security comes and the security shameless. makes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And then you have people that are supposed to be on our side, like Bill Maher saying, like, they should be allowed to eat at restaurants. You shouldn't be able to disturb them. <laughs> and I'm like, the fuck we're not going to disturb them? Like, that's not, no, not anymore. Like, yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. I don't think so. Like, you shouldn't be outside protesting outside people's homes. If I had their addresses, I'd be doing it. You know, like, Bill Maher, he's mm. cute. He's cute. <laughs> he knows how to play both sides and act yeah, vegetarian to stay on the air. 
Yeah, I know. I know. He loves right now. He's up Joe Rogan's ass because that's the popular place to be apparently at the moment. <laughs> you can you can get a lot of money from doing that. Uh, Tom, do we have questions from the audience too? So yeah, I was about to bust in with that. I apologize. No, yeah, right. we do have a bunch of questions from a bunch of uh, loving fans that you have out there. We have Adam Kid online actually asked. Let me bring this up real quick. Oh, you guys were on go. MTV a, a fair bit when it first started out. Do you think you would have gotten on there a couple of years later once the record labels really took notice? Well, the answer is no. And in a couple of years later, they got rid of us. <laughs> uh, true indeed. Let me see. Uh, I have a few was coming it, from. Go, was sorry. it a point of contention when they got rid of Like, was, was it, what's the conversation like when that you find out that happens? Or is there even a conversation after Well, that? first of all, what they did is, you know, they, they um, sabotaged their own mission statement and they tied their playlist to top 40 hit radio. Mm. So they no longer cared about how cool the video was or how original anything was. They would just, you know, whatever songs were in the top 10 on the top 40, they would put those videos in heavy rotation and the videos were just factory videos. You know, they were using the same six directors in every Video looked alike, the same kind of cuts, the same kind of posturing. There was always a girl that got mad and threw a vase that broke on the floor in slow motion. You know, there were mm -hmm. always guys oogling them up. It, you know, it was like, it was bad. It was, yeah. it was sad and stupid. And it was baby pictures for the record company. And so Devo, this, you know, vaunted like, oh, these are art videos. They're so cool. It was like, no, we don't want art videos. And by the way, Devo, uh. We don't see your song in the top 40 here anyway, so goodbye. Show wow. Up. You know, and then when our song did get in, then they started like censoring the videos. Oh my God. And then a guy like Les Garland would call me and go, Okay, uh, we just uh, we just watched your that's good video here at the review board on Monday. And uh, okay, I can tell you something, Casali. You can have the French fry, you can have the donut. But you can't have the French fry going through the donut. We know what you're talking about, right? And I'm like, I start to laugh. You know, I go, I go, listen, it's animation. You put that Rod Stewart video on there where, you know, the girl comes between his legs in tight leather pants and she grabs the cheeks of his butt. And he goes, and it was just like Spinal Tap. He goes, yeah, but he doesn't grab her cheeks. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And this was dead serious conversation. So he goes, so you got two choices. You can edit it and we'll get it on next week or you can stand your ground. Wow. So of course, you know, after much bitching and feeling betrayed, we edit it. This is, I learned my lesson. He goes, I'm sorry, in a week you were, you dropped down two spaces in the top 40. We're not putting it on anyway. Oh wow. my God, what a fucking asshole. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Oh yeah, well that was the game that MTV played. Wow. Jerry, I have to tell you a funny story that you'll probably relate to far too much. Uh, I, I got this story uh, when I had a conversation with Gilbert Gottfried, who was, oh, wow. who was preparing to do a TV spot. And he used to do these impressions holding up these circular drink trays that you know you see waitresses <laughs> carrying on in the club yeah, yeah 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 and so he would hold them up in front of his chest and he would say dolly parton and then he would lower them a little and he'd say dolly parton's mother and then he would lower them to about crotch level and he would say dolly parton's brother <laughs> <laughs> so he's doing this on a tv show and he says to one of the producers can i do all of these and this woman on a headset says hang on a sec and she says back to him, as, as Gilbert reported it back to me, he said, not a smirk, no sense of right, like, right. humor about this. She says, keep the tits, but drop the balls. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. These people are geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, my God. That's Mark great. and I went to dinner with Billy Friedkin when – Cruising had been all cut up and censored. Wow. wow. And he's bitching about it. And we're and I said, well, you know, who are these guys? Like, who censors this stuff? Like, in reality, you know, because it's, it's completely subjective. It's like a tribunal. And he goes, and he names the guy. And he goes, this guy, he's the top guy. And he censors it all. 
And you know what he said when I asked him, why are you taking that out and not that? The guy said to me, if it gives me a hard on, it goes on the cutting room floor. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow. Oh, my and, God. Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny because you forget that there are wow. people behind these operations that are just dumb and they have no, they, they're reacting on emotion and impulse and stupidity. That's right. That's right. And, you know, uh, it's, it just, it never ceases to amaze me. Yeah. The rationale comes later. Yeah. Like the false reasoning and, and the level of discourse that we're all fed, yeah. as, you know, cattle, uh, it comes later. They, they make it up as they go. And, as you were saying, like with these guys like Ted Cruz, yeah. they complete disingenuous level of discourse and and distraction arguments. Absolutely. And, and, and that's and it's really just all about control. Yeah. Control and, for its own sake. Yeah. And to our credit, I think to the artist's credit, too, is we constantly have to learn how to navigate that shit like early on. I have. Uh, that's I the was, real art. That's your that, art. Absolutely. And I had, so uh, I was like a year and in, into stand up, and um, a headliner who had given me, I should actually not be thanking him for this because he gave me this, this Booker's number, who was this horrible guy. Like, just, just the worst, the worst. He was like, if Danny DeVito had an evil twin who popped pills, like that was what this guy embodied and what he looked like. I think, Dan, you might know who this is. I'm not going to say his name on the, for mm -hmm. once, I'm not going to say a name unusual. on the unusual. That's I know. Unusual. Normally, I'm just, I was I, waiting for I, it. I think he might be sick. I don't want to disparage the ill. Um, but uh, so he could be dead. I have no idea. Um, but uh, so anyway, so I he's like, call him and, and ask him for work. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. He's like, tell him you know me, whatever. So I call the guy on the phone and he picks up and he goes, hello. <laughs> and I go, uh, hey, Mr. Whatever. I'm like, you know, my name is John Pover. And he goes, never heard of you. And I go, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't think you would. And I go, but you know, so-and-so told me to call you. And he goes, never heard of him either. Yeah. And I go, oh, okay, um, well, you know, I'm a new comedian. He goes, I don't need anybody. And then he hangs up. And then, so I was like, oh God, yeah. all right, well, whatever. And then a, like a week later, my buddy was like, well, try calling him back again. And I called him back again and he goes, hello. And I said, hey, this is John Poveromo. And he goes, I think I've heard of you. So I was just like, <laughs> I was like, all right. I think I could probably use that sort of strategy for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Literally. And then I just started working for him after that. I think I've heard of you. I'm like, all right. I'm just going to start it. calling. Persistence. Persistence. Yes. I, I just want to call weird. executives and just scream my name into the phone and hang and then, up and like wait a month. <laughs> give it a minute. <laughs> See if this works out. Oh God! Do we have any more questions, Tom? Yep. We do have a couple. Of, a Wait. couple that we're coming across from fans. <laughs> yep, a legion of fans have been checking in today yeah. with all all positive comments. So uh, <laughs> I love this guy's name, Slinky Stinky. He said he <laughs> met you at Pier Seventeen years ago when you you were in a rush, though, so you didn't get a chance to talk to you. And his question was, "Does Jerry remember my disco dome?" I want I want to know what he disco thinks. Disco dome. Was it, From was Pier that, 17. It, it, was it the Devo hat made out of uh, like mirrored squares so it reflected everything? That, sound, that sounds good. We have to see. Sleek. He said he also, uh, his mom said, excuse me, handsome Tim, and he had the funniest look on his face when he turned <laughs> to look at her. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, right, that you made such impact, right, in a moment that it stayed. I think that was backstage, and, and, and I, I don't know how... They got backstage, but they were. But but I was in the middle of having a big problem because, of course, as always, you carefully do everything the promoter tells your tour manager you must do to get your measly six people that could be on your guest list who are good friends of yours who live in New York on the list and get them backstage. And, of course, I do exactly what I'm told, and the tour manager does exactly what he was told to tell me. And they can't get in. And so they're texting me. You know, I've just played for 85 minutes. I'm still sweaty. There's no showers. I'm trying to, like, find out what happened. And, and I realize they're outside with the throngs and they can't get in. And it's very, very, you know, upsetting and insulting, frankly. And mm -hmm. I was trying to deal that. But then all the fans are on your butt. Yeah. You know, and they don't know that you're having a problem and that you never get to rest. Anyway, that's what happened. No, yeah, that <clears throat> I'm glad you said that. That does happen way more than it should. But you did nail it. Yes, sir. It was the reflective yeah. Yeah, I remember, Of course. I couldn't forget that. And Emily said the Pier 17 show was incredible. She actually has a few questions as well. 
What okay. was it like working with Eno? How much control did you have over the production and recording session? And did he use his oblique strategies? He did use his oblique strategies. He really, he foisted those, that card deck on us almost like, I think second day we were in the studio. And <laughs> nice. we thought it was kind of funny. You can imagine Devo, the, you know, brutalist industrial cynics from Ohio that think all that stuff is very pretentious and wanky, not because we're anti-intellectual, but because we feel we've taken it further than that kind of stuff. And, and so we were being humorous about it. And I think he was somewhat hurt and offended that we would deal these cards and then read them and then do humorous takes on it. You know, he, he couldn't believe we were so kind of disrespectful, you know, but that Devo, <laughs> that's, Devo was disrespecting everything. I mean, we, you know, right. Th that's what we did. Yeah. Uh, that was your we, brand. Yeah. We were Dadaists, absurdists. I can't imagine people getting upset at like who know you guys getting upset about that happening. I'd be, I'd be like a badge of honor. I'd be like, I was, yeah. there should be a shirt that says I was disrespected by Devo. I'd wear that shit. But you know, Brian had moved on. You could see he wasn't, mm. wasn't the guy that with no shirt and makeup and a boa and a feathered headdress in Roxy music uh, anymore. He was right. an English gentleman and he was, a, he'd really gone heavily into meditation and Buddhism. And, uh, and he'd been doing that ambient music, like mm. you know, music for airports and beyond. And so he had changed, you know, because his immersion into insane life of being a pop star and touring really produced profound changes. So wow. how did you guys wind up uh, uh, hooking up with Eno for that? For uh, David Bowie. David Bowie was supposed to produce us, but he kept delaying and delaying because he had many projects going on and he decided to do that movie terrible movie terrible movie uh was it gigolo or just a gigolo or oh yeah, yeah 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 or maybe it's just gigolo i don't know just gigolo, anyway, yeah. that was gonna that was gonna delay another two months and, and it was me of course uh the field marshal for devo said david this is this isn't good we we, we don't feel we can wait any longer we're missing the moment. We're missing the zeitgeist. You know, like mm. the Talking Heads have released, and Blondie is released, and P52s are releasing. And we we were ahead of that, or at least we were simultaneous with it. But we were in Ohio, and nobody knew that. So we're just going to look like we're on their coattails. He goes, "Okay, I'll fly to New York. You're going to meet Brian. You know, he loves you guys. Brian and I have talked about you. He can do it right away." in the same studio I was going to do it in, mm. with Connie Plank in Germany. And so we, we flew, we met Brian, had this great, very serious intellectual conversation for hours where he was just drinking tea. And he was in a little, you know, brown pinwheel corduroy pants and navy blue um, v-neck sweater and button down shirt from Savile Row. And, uh, it was great. And wow. we said, OK, we're going to do this. And, you know, three weeks later, we were flying to Germany to do it. Wow. That's incredible. How, we had how a, do you uh, think the album would have been different had Bowie produced it? Not sure. It's all, all speculation. Uh, I'm sure you maybe, thought about it. Yeah, I'm, I know it would have been different. And mm. who knows? Maybe some of those differences would have been great. and Maybe some not so great. I mean, Brian was a very kind of technically oriented guy and so he and connie got along well because they were really into studio techniques and using the board and using effects and brian's synthesizers to to get sounds that frankly we wouldn't have gotten without those guys i always cite it as one of like the most perfect debut albums for any artist yeah, it's very Devo, and in the same way that the Sex Pistols were very Sex Pistols for their debut album. I wish our our album had been that successful as theirs, but uh, mm. I think it's as unique and as kind of seminal as that. Absolutely, agreed. Absolutely. The uh, the more actually asked, what were what were your thoughts the first time you heard the Weird Al version of your song "Dare to Be Stupid"? <laughs> well, frankly, not much. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what Al does really, you know, it's parody, right? It's yeah. Uh, 
to me, that's that's safe territory compared to what we were trying. <laughs> and I uh, yeah, I, I mean, I suppose I wish he would have covered an existing song so that we would have made some money. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a style parody. Yeah. yeah. So much positive energy out in the uh, audience. Emily said, thanks for answering all the questions. Truly sure. good. That's what I do. And, and um, we appreciate you being with us for this for well over over the hour. So thank yeah, you man, so an much. hour blew by. It's an hour and eleven. I want to ask you the big three questions that we ask every guest that comes on the show. <laughs> uh, first question is: If you go back in time and talk to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give yourself that would help you today? <laughs> uh, don't do cocaine. Specific. Not even once. Well, that's the problem. Everybody <laughs> finds. <laughs> Everybody finds the one thing they shouldn't do. I was always very willful, very controlled. You know, I took a few acid trips. I never smoked too much pot. I never did too much THC, nothing, none of it. I never drank too much. Always very controlled, knew when to quit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Moderation. Well, cocaine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, like, I was like, you know, Marmaduke, like, this is good. You know, whoa. <laughs> I like this, you know, like a dog. Um, and then that sends that's you the, on a... That's the best Marmaduke a, reference ever. <laughs> I, the only Marmaduke reference I think I've ever heard. Of. That was beautiful. I, Marmaduke and cocaine in the same sentence. I don't know. I, I, just, I, think, I think this is my last show. I think I'm going to go out on a high note. That's going to be it. Oh, that was hilarious. Marmaduke and cocaine. Holy shit. Um, uh, second question is, what had to end in your life good or bad that led you to where you are today three ways can you elaborate <laughs> yeah good uh, the good answer it's a good it is a good answer absolutely <laughs> you know it it's uh it's, it's a, it, on planet earth it's a road to hell because it's not allowed to happen wow and All you right. you think something wonderful happened and then you pay. <laughs> that's also the greatest answer ever oh my god all right fantastic good advice i mean i don't i i want to get a chance to you know not take it um so <laughs> if anybody out there is offering you know, i'm just saying i mean i haven't i don't I, I get we're supposed to learn from others mistakes but let me, let me give it a shot uh, well it's like walk hard right with dewey cox it's like we're uh <laughs> What's his name? The comedian that was on Saturday Night Live originally. Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell. No, no, the, the black guy that comes in. Oh, every um, scene and goes, dude, you don't want to do this. Yeah, you don't. You know, <laughs> first it's pot, and then it's cocaine, and then it's heroin. It's, uh, it's going to make you feel wonderful. And then Tracy <laughs> Morgan. Uh, no, no, no. It's no, um, no. um, it's no, oh name. my god, this is going to drive me crazy. Um, uh, it's um, he was on SNL for a while. He was on yeah. SNL with Will Ferrell, yeah. and then he left. Um, oh, Tim Meadows. Meadows. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Meadows. Yeah, Nailed yeah. it. He's got the right eyes for that kind of humor. Yeah. The way yeah. It's when he sees that. him doing weed. That's like the best scene ever when he's like, you don't want no. He's like, no, I don't want it. I don't want a hangover. It doesn't give you a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get addicted to it. It's non-addictive. <laughs> well, you don't want to do this, do we? Yeah. <laughs> I don't? <laughs> oh, it's so great. Uh, and the last question I think you'll actually really like too, because it ties into the show. If this was mm -hmm. a a genuine dystopia, worse than it already is now, aliens, zombies, comet headed toward the earth, maybe some climate change. It's everybody's last day on earth. How are you going out? What would be your epic death? With a three-way in cocaine? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> See, maybe you can teach me how to do comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs that to is teach? called a callback right there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is. You see the way I circled around and put it all together. Beautiful. There. But you oh. set me up. You set me up. You're very, you're very welcome. <laughs> I do what I can. Dude, it was a it was a blast having you on, man. Thank you so much. You're you're incredible, man. I hope you come okay. back. Well, thank I hope all you had a good time. Great. Absolutely. I, Such I a pleasure. Talking to you guys. Yeah. Oh. Thanks, Thanks, man. So it was very much. Nice and everybody, you. definitely get the album. It's out now in red yeah. vinyl. It just got pressed. You want to make sure you yeah. check that out. And the single Thanks. is I'm going to pay you back. And you can watch that on YouTube. I'm going to pay you back. I'm proud of that, actually. So Beautiful, man. Yeah. Awesome. We'll definitely plug that it. out. Especially if you're on YouTube right now, make your way on over and take a look at it. It's out now. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jerry. Truly appreciate it. Have nice a great, time, man. great meeting you.
Thanks, guys. Awesome. So oh, no, fun. stick around, Dan. You're staying till the end now. Uh, oh, <laughs> you're going to close it out with us. <laughs> you don't get to wow. go. Well, you get... thank you for letting me, let me uh, crash the party. Anytime, man. Yeah, no, I'm glad I saw the text. I am. Uh, uh, you're going to get to watch me slowly fade out while Tom speaks. It drives him crazy every time. I know. I he, I he just starts to text and do things. I feel like I'm, I have my nephew in the room with me when I do this. As we start to tell everybody, we hope you had a great time out there with us as we did with Jerry today. That really was a really fun interview. That was a blast. Possibly our best answers to our final three so far. oh man it's so great the marmaduke and coke really fucking got me i'm not even that was just i've never heard anybody compare it i'm i'm like marmaduke it's great I, I liked everything about today man have a great night thanks everybody Bye. dystopia tonight